Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Neil Stevenson. I'm principal architect at Hazelcast, and I'm going to give you a demo. So what I'm going to demo today um, is multiple microservices all working together. Uh, so five different languages, uh, all communicating and sharing data uh, through Hazelcast. So they're not communicating with each other. They're communicating with the Hazelcast layer. So we have a common data lake that allows them to work with data that other services have produced. So the problem really which we want to solve, and it's a difficult one for microservices, is you want to be separate, but you want also to be efficient. So really what you want is to be able to use the results from other uh, systems. The data you keep apart as much as possible, but you're not going to have multiple copies of it because you can share that data. So we want different teams to be working with the same data uh, in an efficient manner. And this is what we'll do today. Uh, and there are some little challenges behind the scenes when you talk about multiple teams working in different ways. They're in different languages. So they have different definitions of data. So what's on the left, Java in 32, uh, Java's integer isn't necessarily the same as an int 32 in the likes of Golang or other languages. So um, for today, the problem we're going to solve is the Fibonacci series. Uh, so the Fibonacci series, we'll probably all kind of come across it vaguely. Uh, the Fibonacci of one, the first Fibonacci number is one, the second Fibonacci number is two. And then more generally, each number is the sum of the previous two. Um, now there's a number of ways you can calculate it, uh, but it exhibits what's called a golden ratio. So if you take the sum of the two numbers and divide it by the larger, the ratio is 1.6. It's used in investment. It occurs in science and nature. If you look at things like leaves and plants and animals, uh, you'll find it comes up uh, quite a few times and it's been around uh, for quite a while. So let's have a look at some code. So what we're going to do with this code is we're going to have a store in Hazelcast out in the cloud. Uh, the two green boxes represent a pair of Hazelcast pods, a pair of Hazelcast machines working to net together with a shared store. And we'll be accessing this from multiple languages. I've just shown uh, Node.js and Java. So one calculates a result and stores it for the other one to use. Um, so this is the Golang calculation. Um, this is a, a rip from the actual code, which I might show later. But basically, when you get passed in a, a number i, you have to calculate uh, the previous i and two previous i's. And as we see in a, in a second, those are exponential calculations. So this is actually what the calculation boils down to. To do the calculation for six, you've got to do five and four. Five requires you to do four again, and three, four requires you to do three. So you end up repeating uh, a lot of calculation work. So if we were to, uh, now we've swapped to Python because we're running in multiple languages. If we're using Hazelcast, we can just make a call to Hazelcast Fibonacci map and say, uh, do we have an answer for this uh, input? And if we do, that's us done. And if we don't, we make that same calculation call where we make uh, two apparently recursive calls. Uh, but in fact, that's going to be running in linear time and that's going to run in linear time because we're looking up stored answers. So in the cloud, what does it mean here? It's time for a demo. So I have a Hazelcast cluster that's running out in the cloud. I have uh, two member processes in my cluster. And if I was to connect to that, I can see I have a storage map, uh, which I've called Fibonacci, uh, which is currently empty. Uh, it has nothing in it. And I have currently three clients connected, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, one of these clients is this monitoring tool. Uh, the other client is my little web application. So I've got a web application running out in the cloud that allows me to see uh, the stored Fibonacci results just to, to visualize it. Uh, the important thing here is the Fibonacci, that's just the business logic. Uh, it's not really what it's about. It's about data sharing. And the third client is running on my desktop. So 
this is a Java application that's running on my desktop uh, that's several hundred miles away from uh, that cluster out in the cloud. I don't know where the cloud, cloud cluster actually is, and I don't care. But from this desktop, I can request the sixth Fibonacci number. And what we'll see is that the calculation of six needs five and four and three and two and one. And then it needs two again, it needs three, two, one again, it needs four, three, two, one. So following that basic calculation mechanism is quite inefficient. Whereas we see the Hazelcast version, six just needed five and four. And because we're storing results, we don't need to call anything below uh, twice. But superficially, the local version is faster than the one making the network connection to the cloud. If I repeat the calculation, we'll see that we still do that same 654, 321, 321, 321. But now we don't have to make any further calculations with the Hazelcast stored result. Uh, so the runtime is improved for them both. And there's going to be a bit of paging goes on. But fundamentally, if I'm only doing six, it's not going to stress things out. If I take this up to the 20th Fibonacci number. So, so Neil, um, yep. Hazelcast is actually running both in the cloud as a store and on the desktop. Is that? That's correct. So you just run your client applications where you want. So in this case, it, so the consideration is around networking. So you've got to have, you know, firewall access and all that kind of stuff, security, all these kind of things, if you're going to be connecting from outside the cloud to inside the cloud and your consideration around performance. Um, so because this calculation starts to become quite expensive, if I repeat it, we'll see now that the basic calculations doing the same amount of work every time. My network connection is open. I can get the result back from hundreds of kilometers away faster than I can calculate it locally. And if I take that calculation up just one fraction further to the 23rd calculation, we see that because I'd done 20, we already had those results. So we only needed to do 23, 22, 21. Uh, and we're considerably faster again. I can repeat this and we'll see again that runtime locally is worse now than runtime remotely. Uh, just a little thing. Um, so if I go to my web application, so this is running out in the cloud. If you type that URL quickly, you can actually see this running. There's the 23rd Fibonacci number uh, and what it actually is. But we mentioned uh, querying. So one of the things we want to see is in our Fibonacci map, I have 23 results. If I drill into it, and just scroll down. Uh, it uses a sharding mechanism. So those results are stored across two processes so, because I'm running two. So 10 are on one and there's 10 backup copies on the other copy uh, and 13 is on the other and the other 13 backups are on the remote process pair. So I, all my data is out in the cloud on multiple processes. So I've also got that resilience protection in case there's like some sort of hardware fault. And just if I want to, I can run SQL against this and I can see, you know, the 14th key has the value of 377, uh, which will be the same as here. So now it's time to kind of go to another language. So I'm going to kick off. Um, I'm running this in Google Cloud, but it wouldn't really matter. Um, I'm going to kick off a script to launch a pod in Golang. So that will be a Golang node, a microservice node running in the cloud, connecting to this cluster. And if I'm quick, I can get the results from it. There we go. So Golang is now doing calculation. I've asked it to calculate 25 and look at the numbers. It's still doing that same inefficient calculation. Um, but the caching version, the version using the locals compute stored value is so much faster. So that's a uh, goal line. So, so Neil, where's the store actually at? Is it in Google Cloud or is it? It's in Google in, Cloud. It's in it, Google it, Cloud as well. It doesn't matter which cloud. They're just that's I know, I understand. I'm just trying to understand. It's still saying three milliseconds to access 25 or 26 <laughs> records. It yeah. seems long, especially if, if it's coming out of memory. Yeah, but it's, remember, it's, it's making that initial connection. If you repeat it, it then starts to optimize it. And you can do um, 
that level two caching idea. So any value that you've calculated, you can store locally um, and reuse. So then you don't even have to make the network call. It depends how much you think the network call is significant or not. Um, yep. And yep. for this, if it's a really expensive calculation, uh, the time to retrieve the result is insignificant. Right. For other data, that's the reverse. Okay. So just to, um, to keep going with this, what I'll now do is I'll kick off uh, C++, Python, and Node.js. And then while I'm going to do that, I'm also going to change the size of my cluster. Um, so I've got a set of two for my Hazelcast uh, cluster. I'm just going to scale that up. The set name, and I want, uh, let's go for three. And what we'll see is my set has got two and it should have three. So Kubernetes in the background will go and add an extra uh, process to that cluster. Uh, and I don't know when that will occur, um, sometime in the next minute. If we happen to look, we'll see that this is the code. I've got code here for C++. I've got code here for Java. I've got code here for Node.js. They're all doing the same calculation in their own little flavor um, of language, but fundamentally it's the same because you're going to be doing the same business logic. What we're sharing here is the result of the calculation, not the, the input. So in the background, let's have a look at, um, let's see what's running, what one has started. Let's pack uh, Node.js. So I've asked Node.js to go and do a calculation um, and here's its result. Uh, so point not, not, not two um, seconds to access the Hazelcast version, uh, 17 seconds to calculate it itself. I will also see there's a log message. Our cluster is now increased. Uh, to three processes. So we're a little bit better off there. Um, and now, if I really wanted to, we'll see the Java processes notice an extra cluster member has joined in. But let's make a, a larger Java, a larger Fibonacci number. I'll request the 30th in sequence. But what we can see out on the web is we have 25 Fibonacci numbers. If I go back to my cluster, I can see that now I've got more clients connected and more members. And if I look at my Fibonacci map, we'll see that it's now spread that data across multiple processes. Neil, uh, why, did you, why did you feel you had to increase the, uh, the store cluster size to three nodes from two? It's really just to show you can do that while it's running. Oh, okay, it wasn't a requirement for the five. No, no, no. And, and more realistically, you might want to do that with some sort of auto scaling when you're, you've got this specific volume of data goes above some threshold, you want to maybe scale up. Uh, conversely, if your data uh, drops down because you're expiring data out, you might want to uh, shrink back down. So that kind of um, elasticity, I was just demonstrating manually. How would you tell that the data is uh, no longer being used or, or couldn't be purged or something like that? You have um, expiry and eviction mechanisms. You can say this data I want to discard if I've not read it or written it within a certain time interval, or this data I want to expire when uh, I want to discard when memory usage goes above a certain lim level. So you can do it based on time or based on space. Uh, so you find that certain things like are done on uh, on time, like something like an HTTP session. You're logged in. You're if you're idle for a while, it's discarded, and that's you logged out. Okay, thanks. So fundamentally, uh, summary time. You're going to have different teams working in different languages, but they can share data. Uh, and although uh, a lot of the times that data is coming from a database for reference data and that kind of stuff, and you've got data coming in externally from transactional data, you can also be calculating that data, building it. Um, and if you're using a central store that's uh, super fast, then your developers are going to get their answers quicker. Your business will be more dynamic. Uh, and just a, a reference back to that question, you can also have local copies and you can have local copies of the entire cluster, or you can have just a local copy of a piece of the data. So you can do that kind of replication um, from place to place. So you have a nearby copy. And Neil, um, you also mentioned uh, format, uh normalization, I guess, is that how I'd call it? Yeah, so you've got to be wary of things like, you know, the order of languages, how they write bytes. 
Um, so you might think of something as a bite and is it big endian or little endian? You've got to take care of those kind of considerations between languages. So you have to make sure that you understand the actual format that's been shared. Um, so you need a little bit of data governance there. You know, is it the highest byte is the most significant or the lowest byte is the most significant? If you don't get that right, then you're not going to share the results successfully between languages. All right, thanks. I mean, that's just a little detail, but it's, it becomes a big detail if you get you get it wrong. Neil, that demo was was just about the, the caching, you know, the, the actual data availability component, not the transform and, um, and stream data coming in. Correct. Yeah, this was more just about the, the microservices working together. Um, you know, but when a, when one process is requesting data from Hazelcast, it doesn't know where it's come from. Has it been calculated by another process? Has it is it kind of static data that's been loaded in from a database? Has it been computed as a result of uh, stream processing? It's just about the you know when you run a query. All you care about is the output of the query. You don't really care about where the the result originated. But there's a whole piece of the platform where you could have streaming data coming in to populate that key value pairs that you've got in there rather Absolutely. than having, having your yeah, application. Yeah. So you could be maintaining the, the current temperature or current stock prices or all these kind of things.